I am, you are, we be, beyond all the labels, beyond all the experiences, beyond all the judgments, that's what we are, the music behind the music, the I behind the I am. Breathe that in for a minute. Feel it, sense it, know it at the depth of who you are. It's what you've always been. It's what you will always be. When you're up, when you're down, when it's dark, when it's light, it makes no difference. It is eternal. It is immortal. It is absolute. I want to re uh, we quote that uh, Meister Eckhart quote again. I want you to say it with me. Let's put it up one more time together with impassion and excitement. The eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, one love. That's the foundation of the house I want to build today. This is the culmination today of a five-part series for the month of May. We began our series with the heart of the matter. When we played with the idea and the truth that it's all love. Everywhere we look, everywhere we see, everything we experience is love if you look deeply enough. If you have the eyes and the ears to look for it with a dogged determination, you will find love. It's the matter. It's the, it's the source behind all creation. Week two, the heart of the mother, as we claim the miracle that we are the mothers of the new reality. That if we want to experience more love, we must be the emissaries, the ambassadors, the portal, the avenue, and the creators, and yes, the mothers of that love. We took full and complete responsibility as the mothers of the universe. Then we went into the heart of the moment, and we realized in week three that we're only one breath. Take a breath with me. You're only one breath away from the full expression of the mother that you are. You're only one, ex one breath away from love being made manifest in the experience and in the expression. One breath away from love being received no matter what's going on on the outside. You're one breath away. That's the heart of the moment. Then we talked about the heart of the child, and I want to invoke the Unitines who made these beautiful God's eyes into the moment. The heart of a child where we recognize that we have to get rid of all the garbage that we have piled on ourselves all the adult years and return to becoming like a child. We used to be innocent, sweet, in a sense of awe because we must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is the full expression and experience of that love. But we've got to do some letting go. We've got to do some releasing. We've got to be unattached to everything that we think that it might be in the way of finding that love yet again. Today, we come to the final week and a final talk, and it's the heart of a mystic. How many mystics do we have in the room today? So my job, I got a few of you, my job is to convince all of you that each one of you is a mystic and that you're only one heartbeat, one breath away from that expression, that next time I ask you that question, every hand will go up and say, yes, I am a mystic, no less than the greatest teachers and prophets who have ever walked the face of the planet. So what is a mystic? Meek Herrick, call it out. What is a mystic? The seer. The what? One who hears, one who sees, one who seeks, one who knows. A mystical person is that person who knows and who seeks unity with all that is. Not just some of it. All that is everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Say that with me. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. If you can integrate that at any level of your heart and your mind, you are also a mystic. Through contemplation, through meditation, through self-surrender and absorption of that truth that it's all God. It's all love. It's all one. This awareness will absolutely transcend your intellect. I hate to tell you that. Everything you've learned, this, is, this idea and this mystical awareness is going to transcend your intellect. It will transcend your faith. I'm asking you to suspend your faith. Everything that got you to where you are today has to be set down so that you can become the full active mystic. It will transcend your belief. It will transcend any need to control. And it will transcend any limitation you've ever accepted in your life. Breathe that in. It is the great isness. The great I am. It is the I behind the I am. It is beyond words. It's a great knowing that I am not, I cannot, I never have been, and I never will be separate from all creation. I am not, cannot, will not, and have never been separate from God. 
I am not, cannot, and will not ever be separate from the love that I was created in and as. Oh, now the yeah buts start in the room. Yeah, but I've got evidence. I've got evidence. Let me show you my evidence. You know what? We need to get rid of the evidence and start being that which is only found in the mind of a child, the love. That's the heart of the matter. That's the heart of the mother, the heart of the child, the heart of the moment, the heart of right now, the heart of a mandala, the heart of the songs that you're hearing today. Breathe that in. And it is a, not something that we can teach. It's not something that you can learn. It is something that we allow. Can you be in a state of allowing today? You know, Sonia, we all love Sonia. I mentioned her name and the place goes nuts. The heart of a mystic is one who allows. She has a plan. She does have a left brain. And she puts it out, an idea, and then God takes over. And she allows God to work through her. She allows God. Bob and Shannon, the reason they're so effective as musicians and singers is they allow something greater to move through them. They're pretty amazing human beings, but it's the spiritual I am that's behind it that suddenly magic happens. Magic and art and beauty happens. And that same magic and beauty and art, it's not isolated in these people I've mentioned. It is in everyone in this room. Turn to somebody to your left and your right and say, you are a work of art. Turn to the other side and say, you're a work of heart. Turn to somebody in front of you, behind you, and say, you are a mystic. I'm asking you to get into a state of allowing today. In the allowing, we become a mystic, no less than the great teachers, no less than Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, Lao Tzu, all of the above. Rumi, Meister, Eckhart, all going to be quoted today. What's the only difference between these great thinkers that have walked the face of the earth, or Sonia and Bob and Shannon? The only difference between them and the rest of the world? They are allowing God, and we are seeking God. Whoa, big distinction. Seeking, clutching, grasping to find God. Give me another workshop. For God's sake, let me have another answer. Let me read another book to find God. These people, the mystics on the planet, allow God and get out of the way. Amen. Amen. The mystic Atiba has absolutely spoken. That's the only difference. So what constitutes a mystical experience? Sonia, what constitutes a mystical experience when you're making this? What makes it up? To, to disappear in a way. Oh, I love that. To disappear in a way so that I can appear. What about you guys? What, what is it that constitutes a mystical experience for you? They didn't know I was going to put them on the spot. <laughs> Allowing. Allowing. That's the best word. Allowing. Oh, good. I, we, we're of one yeah, mind. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> a state of allowing. Let me give you some words before we have another song that I think constitute what we're all seeking, what we do here at Unity North to get us to that edge. Hey, Harry Cohn, the mist. You want to say something? Yeah. Go for it. When a 102-year-old veteran in the room wants to speak, you make room. <laughs> He was in a, we have the microphone there. It's, right, it's underneath uh, Cecilia's chair. Let's go ahead and turn it on for him. I hope you can hear me this way. Yeah, we can hear you okay. good. Thank you. I was coming home. I was coming in a, in a hospital ship from the South Pacific, and we were dodging submarines as, as the time, and finally we're getting close to America. And the captain of our ship said, we're going to go under the Golden Gate Bridge in about an hour and a half. And how many of you want to be with, with me? And so every clutch, crutch and cane and whatever could be moving was heading for topside so we could go under the bridge. Well, in about an hour before we were going under the bridge, he said, we'll be there in about another 15 minutes. So would it be prepared? And so I got my position where I could hear and watch and see everything going on. And then finally he said, now, here we go, get ready. And we went under the, the bridge. And as we were going under the bridge, I looked up, closed my eyes, 
and said, thank you, God, for bringing us home. Hmm. That's right. Part of that story, I get to have uh, lunch with Harry about once a month, and a part of that story he didn't tell is that when he got off the ship, he kissed the earth. He kissed the earth. The awareness, the mystical awareness that he was one with the earth. A soldier coming home. And we'll, we'll honor our veterans on Veterans Day, but I want to be mindful that today is Memorial Day, and we're honoring those that have fallen in battle. We'll honor Harry, believe me, we always do on Veterans Day, but we want to honor those who gave their life. So I want to give you the words of a mystical experience. When Harry shares, he finds the words because he's a great orator, but the reality is it is beyond words. The mystical experience is ineffable. Say that with me, ineffable. That means there are no words to understand it. They are words are merely road markers pointing us in the direction of the direct experience. Words, we have lots of words here at Unity North. Anybody who knows me says I use lots of words. But they are nothing more than fingers pointing at the moon, as the song said. Fingers pointing at the moon. And so many times we, in our religious paths, put all of our attention on the fingers pointing at the moon, and we forget to see the moon. There comes a point when the words pointing at the light that we are seeking need to move aside and stop. And we enter the silence, and we are just one with the place of the moon. This is the job here at Unity North. As spiritual seekers, as those becoming and remembering the moon, our oneness with the moon is to use the pointer to get us there, the words, the ideas, the spiritual principles, and once our focus is, is set and our gaze is there, get the words out of the way. The mystical experience cannot be put into words. I would love to be able to give you a, a book that says, this is exactly how you find your oneness with God. There is no book ever written. It's just road signs. Road signs pointing you in the direction of yourself. They're merely there to take you to the silence. Yes, we can cogitate, we can ruminate, we can speculate, we can deliberate, and we can elucidate, and we do that well. But it eventually has to culminate in the silence, the place of no words, the place of no thought, the place of no principle, the place of being. You watch Sonia create the mandala. And actually, I was at the Unitines when we got together on a Saturday evening. I made at least one of those God's eyes. You get to the place where you're, it's hard. How do I do this? I'm not sure how to make that God's eye. The prayer shawl. You go spend some time with the people in the prayer shawl ministry. They've been doing it for years. They're not thinking. It's muscle memory. It's a state of being. This mandala is a culmination of junior high kids getting out of their head. More, we need more of that in the planet, don't we? Elders getting out of their head. Artists getting out of their head. Spiritual seekers getting out of their head. In fact, I want you to say with me, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> Do you really mean that? Because that's where I'm pointing you. That's where I'm directing you to get out of your mind. And it's a great paradox. All these fingers pointing to the moon... By transcending language and thought, we get to the oneness. And in that state, the mystical experience becomes noetic and illuminative. Say that with me. Noetic and illuminative. What does that mean? Well, it means it's a great straight state of transformative thoughts, insights, revelations, and epiphanies. You know you're there when there's a great download of God. Things you did not know before begin to emerge. Where did that come from? It came from God. Where did this vision come from? It came from God. A download that is allowed, not forced. A download that is allowed and not manifested. So many times in New Thought I get so frustrated that we're all about manifestation, manifestation. I'm working hard to make another manifestation. And the reality is we've put the cart before the horse. Being precedes getting. Being precedes manifestation, and the mystics are simply being. That's why they want for nothing. This is why silence is a central part of the experience. The moon is a central part of the experience. Intellect no longer has a purpose when you get there because it's getting in the way of wisdom. Breathe that in. Intellect is the tool to get you there, but then it no longer has a purpose because now it's in the way of the wisdom that wants to come out. 
belief. All the machinations of our religious belief systems no longer have a purpose because they're getting in the way of truth. Get out of the way. My belief system, I'm so attached to my belief system, I can't see the moon. And I think our religious systems, for all the good they've done on the planet, are in the way. And that includes Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. I'm going to probably lose my job tomorrow. <laughs> but the reality is we have to come to the place where we let it all go. And it's a great paradox. You see, the mystical path is also paradoxical. What does that mean? It means I use the thought to get me there, to the edge of the unknown, and then I have to release the thought that got me there so I can jump into the mystery and the unknown and then receive the download of new thoughts. But they are God thoughts, not human thoughts. They are spiritual ideas, not human, egotistical ideas. So yes, let's take our religions and let's go to the moon, put them down, and then let the download begin by allowing it to be. And what is that going to require of us? What is that going to require of us? Let's be spiritual students. What does it require of you? Openness. Letting go. Bing, give the lady a lollipop. She's got the right answer. They're all right. There are no wrong answers. But the, the mystical path is also passive and it is purgative. Say that with me. Passive and purgative. What does that mean? It requires you to let go of control. Oh, I hate this one. I've got to let go of control to completely surrender and to release my life to higher energies of oneness, of truth, than my religious doctrine, than my dogma, than my belief system, my BS. Energies that won't make any sense to the human mind. That's why paradox is so necessary. You cannot figure a paradox out with the mind. You can't create this work of art with only your mind. Your heart must be leading the way. The spirit must be leading the way. It cannot be rationalized by the brain. So I'm challenging you, the mystics in the room today, to let go of anything you've ever held on to to define yourself. All the labels that the song just talked about, you're not any of it. Let them go. But I'm asking you also to let go of the labels of good and bad. Let me tell you, it's been a hard, difficult week. And it's so easy to say, everywhere I look, I see the face of God, just not in that person. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God, just not that evil. If we are true mystics, we have to drop down into the place of loving the people who have forgotten. Loving the people who have committed heinous, heinous, heinous atrocities on the planet. We must let go of our judgment of whatever war those soldiers who lost their life fought in and live as the vibrating center of love. And that means getting rid of everything that is not love. It is purgative. Let it go. Give it up. This mandala is going to be torn down right after the service. A lot of hours of work. It's going to be gone. A symbol of impermanence. But love is forever changing, isn't it? And if we are an evolving spirituality, we are an evolving group of mystics, we have to be willing to evolve and not dig our heels into our religious belief systems that have become outdated, but to allow God to use us to write gospels right here, right now. Yes? To allow truth to be expressed right here, right now through you. What makes Bob and Shannon's music so powerful is the writers and the singers, they happen to be the same people, have a deep mystical understanding of non-attachment. Non-attachment to the beautiful melodies and the potent lyrics that eventually lead us to the power that's underneath all those beautiful lyrics. The power that's underneath those beautiful melodies. I love when Bob and Shannon come. A lot of singers come and they say, here's the three songs I'm going to do. Oh, wait a minute. How about we co-create something? And we get on the phone and we brainstorm. What's cooking? What wants to happen? What song do you got? And suddenly, they're no longer attached to the song that they thought they were going to sing when they came in the room, but they're attached to letting God work through them. They're doing a song today that they've never sung publicly because I went, that's it. That's it. And we were, I was joking with Bob earlier. I said, have you ever had a moment where you forget the lyrics on stage? It happens to me all the time. And then we were in the sound check, and he's singing the song, and he says, that was the moment right there. <laughs> and we laughed, 
and we smiled and we lived in the moment of imperfection. It's because beyond the lyrics, beyond the music, beyond the experience of a service, there was a mystical awareness that it's all love and it's all God. And that means we've got to let go. It's a purgative state. I give up anything and everything that's ever defined me with the song that they're going to sing now. The looser my grip, the greater the expression will be. I'm inviting you to actually physically, as they sing this song, hold your hands tight when they start, and by the end of the song, put everything into those hands that you've ever defined yourself, all the labels, all the judgment of good and bad, and go like this, and exhale, and release it into the universe, because at the edge of that unknown is a greater chapter of who you are meant to be. Officially good morning. I wanted to say officially good morning. And um, I want to say that we actually host a retreat. Well, I should say before of COVID. <laughs> Every year we did a retreat and we did a mandala one year. And we, you know, all the group just painted this mandala and it was beautiful. And it was up on the wall. And at the end of it, we went over and ripped it down and watched their faces in horror. It was beautiful. I loved it. And I think we sang this song right after this. This song is, was inspired by a refrigerator magnet. And it said, let go or be dragged.
lighter, the lighter, the lower. Shannon Plummer. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You know, it's funny, you can't clap with those closed fists. <laughs> you can't celebrate with a closed fist. You can't worship with a closed fist. It doesn't work so well. The looser the grip, the lighter the load, the more worship, the more joy, the more God, the more magnificence, the more mystics on the planet. Let me continue with what constitutes a mystical experience. It is pantheistic in nature. Say that with me. Pantheistic. That means it is the recognition that God, as the source energy of the entire universe, is everywhere present at all places at all times. Oh, it may have been missed. It may be missed, but just because we fail to see it does not mean that it is not there at the core. I want you to breathe that in. Just because we fail to find God doesn't mean God isn't present. Just because we fail to find love, it does not mean that love is not present. Ours is to come back to center, to the mystical awareness, to open the hands and to worship that which is maybe hard to find, but it is our job as the ambassadors and the emissaries of love to find it and to not put that responsibility on somebody else. It's easier to hate, isn't it? It's just easier to be angry. The mystic accesses God at all times. The mystic sees the light even in the darkest of times. We teach our kids there is no spot where God is not. Everything we see, feel, touch, know, and experience has at its core the energy of God. Not an egocentric, capricious type of temperamental personality of mankind's making but a power so beautiful, so powerful, so, so magnificent that it is an energy that is not a respecter of human beings. It is everywhere present as life itself, as love itself. Beneath the surface is a spiritual force that is eternally expressing without prejudice. It just is. It just is you. It just is me. It just is Harry Cohn. It just is Bill. It just is the fallen soldiers. It is just the children. And let me meddle a little bit. If our belief system has any foundation to it at all, it is also in the hand and the heart of a gunman that took the lives of the children this week. Ooh, that, now, that's, now you're meddling. Many paths, one God, just not that one. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God, just not him. Compassion will save the planet, not judgment. Compassion will save the planet, not hate, not anger. Compassion is what we are called to do right now. It doesn't mean that there are no consequences. There should be consequences. Pay unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But there has to be love, or we're going to be here 10 years from now. Wednesday night at the Wednesday night meditation service, I read something that I, I wrote when I was once again as a minister looking for words. It was called the, the whale that washed up on my beach, and I wrote it 10 years ago after Newtown, Connecticut, and the loss of child, children's lives. And I talked to Nicole Glasgow on Thursday after I did that meditation yet again on Wednesday night, and she says she had an overwhelming sense of sadness that it was still relevant. I could read the same poem that I'd written 10 years ago, and I had to read it again. Folks, I don't want to read that poem ever, ever again. What happened or what didn't happen from 10 years ago to this week? If you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, you're going to get the same results. I don't want to read that poem again. And we all have different ways of how to solve it. And we get into our rooms and we argue and we fight. And we throw mud at each other. I'm right, you're wrong. How's that working for us? Not so well. I must behold the pantheistic nature of life. God is everywhere present 
And so what gave me hope and peace and some degree of comfort this week is a thought that Harry Cohn told me every time he repeats himself a lot. It happens when you're 102. He says, there are no atheists in foxholes. There are no atheists in trenches. Suddenly, we're forced into a deeper awareness of what is true at the core. And what gave me comfort is that I teach children in this church there is no spot where God is not. And I said this first service and my wife completely disagreed with me. But I will hold fast to it. That if we are one, those children in a fourth grade class about to lose their life entered the kingdom of heaven before they were murdered. That they had the ability in the fear, in the darkness, to look into the eye of the person who was going to take their life and some part of them could see there is no place where God doesn't exist and maybe there was a little bit of compassion. And that's not a popular opinion this week. But if the bedrock of what I teach on this platform every Sunday has any merit whatsoever, I need to do things differently. After Newtown, Connecticut, I railed and I was angry. And then I look at the people who went to court and forgave the gunmen, mothers and fathers who found compassion. Pay unto Caesar, it was taken care of. But pay unto God, I forgive you. We're going to go through crucifixions, and right now the human race and our nation is in the midst of a crucifixion. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. And the only way I slept this week was to say that these children, somehow, some part of them, found that same Christ-like consciousness, Christ-like energy, and their lives will not be in vain I look at the hangnails and the inconveniences of my life. I need to do it more. I need to be compassionate more readily. I need to love more deeply. I need to find a different answer because of what we're doing isn't working. And I won't sit down and argue with at a table who's right or wrong about how to solve the problem. But let's open up a field across the aisle and start figuring out something different than what we have done and to behold that the presence of God is sitting on the other side of the aisle from you. And let's work together because the mystical experience is also unitive. It is unitive with God, with all creation, with each other, with all life, including a gunman. The eye by which I see God It's the same eye through which God sees me. My eyes and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, one love. This series, this five-week series, was about bringing us to the edge of our limited understanding of God, of love and oneness, very limited human understanding, and say, let's dive into a different reality. And maybe we won't have to read that poem again in 10 years or two years or two months I'm not asking you just to hear the messages that I've delivered for five weeks, but to integrate them into a mandala, a tapestry of oneness. Not just talking a good game of oneness, but knowing it and claiming it. We teach that all the characters in the Bible live in us. Jesus lives in us. Judas lives in us. Peter lives in us. Well, every child, 19 children also live in us, and so does a gunman. We are all one. There's only one of us here on earth. And if we're going to save this planet, we need to know that at depth and let the mystical heart be more than we've ever known before. There's nothing between you and God. There's nothing between you and the entire cosmos. And again, what a great paradox this is. All of everything we do in this platform, the songs, The messages, the talks, is to lead us to that great unknown mystery. And then to tell you, you got to do it alone. And you do. The hero's final destination, the final dive, the final slaying of the dragon, you have to do it alone. Nobody here is going to do it for you. And then when you jump off, 
This is the paradox. You realize that you were never alone to begin with. This week, I felt very alone as a minister. You may have felt very alone. What do I do? How do I change this? How do I celebrate Memorial Day when this has happened? I don't know how. You got what came. God kissed me and said, say this. Right or wrong, it's what God gave me to say. But I'm challenging us as a congregation to jump into that mystery alone. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. And then realize you were never alone. A little music would be nice underneath. Paramahansa Yogananda, one of the great mystics of the, the earth, wrote this beautiful poem based on an ancient Hindu myth called, Where Shall We Hide the Truth from Man? Where shall we hide the truth from man? The gods all cried when he was made. And forgive the pronouns, it's old language. How can we guard our secret now? They asked each other, most afraid. Hide it in the earth, he will mine it. Hide it on a mountain, he will climb it. Even in the sea, he will find it. Where shall we hide the truth from man? Quite beside themselves, they cried. This little guy will take our throne. We have made him far too smart not to claim our heaven home. Hide it in matter, he'll analyze it. Hide it in the water, he'll crystallize it. Even in hell, he'll surmise it. Where shall we hide the truth from man? They thought of the stars in outer space or in the nature of a tree, but they knew that man could solve each and every mystery. Hide it in the wind, he'll pursue it. Hide it in an act, he will do it. Even in an atom, he will view it. Where shall we hide the truth from man? And then they solve the mystery of how frightened, how the frightened gods could win. And the wisest one said, let's take the truth and let's hide it deep inside of him. Hide it in his heart, he will doubt it. Hide it in his soul, he'll live without it. Even if we should reveal and shout it, he won't believe the truth is within. I've shouted it over and over and over and over again today. It's within you. It's not in any holy book. Those are pointing at the moon. It's not in any song that's pointing you to the moon. It's within you. Truth is in this mandala. It is in the God's eye. It is in the prayer shawls. It is in the children and the elders. Truth is in the forest, the garden, the song, the lyrics. It's in the ideas that we share here every Sunday. But let's get them out of the way so that we can find the truth that exists within us. Follow the road signs. At the end of the day, the heart of the matter, the heart of the mother, the child, the heart of the moment is that truth has always been and always will be within you as the mystic, you as the prophet, you as the savior, you as the one. The song is called, They 